Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Grante, and today we've got another video in season 12 of my audiobook series. In this season, we're reading through the 15 invaluable laws of growth, and today is chapter 2, The Law of Awareness. You must know yourself to grow yourself. Enjoy. This video is part of an audiobook series featuring the 15 invaluable laws of growth. Live Them and Reach Your Full Potential, written by John C. Maxwell in 2012. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel, find me on Spotify, or check out my website for downloads. Chapter 2, The Law of Awareness, You Must Know Yourself to Grow Yourself. And it starts with a quote from James Russell Lowell, quote, No one can produce great things who is not sincere in dealing with himself, end quote. In 2004, Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore starred in a comedy called Fifty First Dates. It is the story of a man who falls in love with a young woman, only to discover that she cannot remember him the next day. In fact, she can't remember anything that has happened to her since a car crash she was in a year before. She is destined to live every day as if it were the day before her accident. It, is, it was a cute movie, even if the premise seems a bit silly, but what if something like that were true and had actually happened? No recall. There is a famous neuropsychology case of someone with a similar condition that was first documented in 1957 and has been studied by thousands of doctors and researchers. The patient is called Hem Henry M. He was born in Hartford, Connecticut in 1926 and suffered from a case of epilepsy that was so severe and debilitating that he couldn't function. At age 27, he underwent an experimental surgery in which parts of his brain were removed to try to treat his epilepsy. The good news was that after the surgery, he no longer suffered from constant debilitating seizures. In addition, he suffered no negative impact on his intelligence, personality, or ability to interact with others socially. However, there was one horrible side effect. He seemed to have no short-term memory. Henry couldn't remember anything that happened after the surgery. He didn't recognize his doctors. He couldn't find his way to the bathroom. When he returned home, he would do the same jigsaw puzzles every day and read the same magazines without having any memory of doing so. When his family moved to a new house, he could never remember having moved, nor could he find the way to the new home, though he remembered his old one vividly. When interviewed 30 minutes after lunch, he could not recall a single item he had eaten. In fact, he could not remember having eaten at all. He was stuck in time, unable to learn, grow, and change. What a tragedy. Do you have a sense of direction? Any person who wants to grow but doesn't know himself is in many ways like Henry M. To grow, you must know yourself, your strengths and weaknesses, your interests and opportunities. You must be able to gauge not only where you've been but also where you are now. Otherwise, you cannot set a course for where you want to go. And of course, every time you want to learn something new, you must be able to take the new thing you've learned today and build upon what you learned yesterday to keep growing. That's the only way to gain traction and keep improving yourself. To reach your potential, you must know where you want to go and where you currently are. Without both of those pieces of information, you are liable to get lost. Knowing yourself is like reading, you are here, on a map, when you want to find your way to a destination. I've observed that there are really only three kinds of people when it comes to having direction in life. The first type, people who don't know what they would like to, know, to do. These people are often confused. They lack a strong sense of purpose. They don't possess a sense of direction for their lives. If they are growing, they are unfocused about it. They dabble. They drift. They can't reach for their potential because they have no idea what to shoot for. The second type, people who know what they would like to do, but don't do it. These people are usually frustrated. Every day they experience the gap between where they are and where they want to be. Sometimes they aren't doing what they want because they worry that it will cause them to neglect other responsibilities, such as providing for their family. Sometimes they aren't willing to pay the price to learn, to grow, and to move closer to where they want to be. Other times, fear prevents them from changing course to pursue their passion. No matter what the reason, they too miss their potential. Type 3. People who know what they would like to do and do it. 
The third type of people know themselves, possess a strong sense of passion, are focused in purpose, grow in areas that help them move closer to their purpose, and do what they were created to do. The word that best describes them is fulfilled. Few situations are as extreme as Henry M's, yet most people seem to fall into the first category. They don't know what they want to do. I believe the main reason is that they don't know themselves as well as they should, and thus remain unfocused in their growth. Knowing yourself isn't necessarily an easy thing for everyone to do. In a commencement address at Princeton, future American President Woodrow Wilson proclaimed, quote, We live in an age disturbed, confused, bewildered, afraid of its own forces, in search not merely of its road but even of its direction. There are many voices of counsel but few voices of vision. There is much excitement and feverish activity but little concert of thoughtful purpose. We are distressed by our ungoverned, undirected energies and do many things, but nothing very long. It is our duty to find ourselves, end quote. Wilson made that statement in 1907. Imagine what he might have said if he were alive today. What makes finding themselves and growing to their potential difficult for some people is that it is a bit of a catch-22. You have to know who you are to grow to your potential, but you have to grow in order to know who you are. So what's the solution? Explore yourself as you explore growth. The way to start is to pay attention to your passions. For me, that started when I focused my growth in areas that I knew would help me as a minister, which was my passion. The four areas can be represented by the word real, relationships, equipping, attitude, and leadership. My passion led to my growth, but then my growth led to my passion, and I discovered my love and ability for leadership. That has continued to be a major focus of my personal growth for nearly 40 years. Other areas that passion and purpose revealed include faith, family, communication, and creativity. All of these continue to be important parts of my life where I love to learn and to grow. How to Find Your Passion and Purpose Psychotherapist Nathaniel Brandon asserts, quote, The first step toward change is awareness. The second step is acceptance, end quote. If you want to change and grow, then you must know yourself and accept who you are before you can start building. Here are 10 questions to help you start working through that process. Question 1. Do you like what you're doing now? I am amazed by how many people I meet every day who don't like what they are doing for a living. Why do they do it? I understand the necessity of having to make a living. We've all done jobs we didn't love. I worked in a meatpacking plant when I was in college, and I didn't like that job. But I didn't stay there my whole life doing something I found unfulfilling. If I'd loved it, and it had fit my passion and purpose, I would have stayed there and tried to build a career. But it wasn't what I wanted to do. Philosopher Abram Cap- Abraham Kaplan noted, quote, If, as Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living, so the unlived life is worth examining. End quote. If you're not enjoying what you do for a living, you need to take some time to examine why. It is, a, is it a risk making a change from what you're currently doing to what you want to do? Of course. You might fail. You might find out that you don't like it as much as you expected. You might not make as much money. But isn't there also great risk in staying where you are? You might fail. You might get fired. You might take a pay cut. Or, worst of all, you might come to the end of your life feeling regret for never having reached your potential or doing what you love. Which risk would you rather live with? Question two, what would you like to do? There is definitely a direct connection between finding your passion and reaching your potential. TV journalist Maria Bartiromo says, quote, Every successful person I've met has a strong sense of his or her unique abilities and aspirations. They're leaders in their own lives, and they dare to pursue their dreams on their own terms. End quote. Have you found and harnessed your passion? Do you know what you would like to do? When you do, it makes all the difference. And why? When you tap into your passion, it gives you the E and E factor, energy and excellence. You will never fulfill your destiny doing work you despise. Passion gives you an advantage over others because one person with passion is greater than 99 who have only an interest. Passion gives you energy. As a kid, all I ever wanted to do was play. I didn't like work. But I learned the power of tapping into my passion when I transitioned from high school to college. 
In high school, I was simply marking time. But when I got to college, I was working in areas connected to my purpose. I was pursuing my passion, and that got me excited. I'm still excited about what I do. Now that I'm in my mid-60s, people ask me when I will retire. To be honest, that's not on my radar. Why would anyone want to quit doing what he loves? Nothing's work unless you'd rather be doing something else. Want to know when I'll retire? When I die. That's when I will stop speaking and writing books. How do you know what you want to do? How do you tap into your passion? The answer, listen to your heart. Pay attention to what you love doing. Blitzer Prize winning journalist and author Thomas L. Friedman advises, quote, Whatever you plan to do, whether you plan to travel the world next year, go to graduate school, join the workforce, or take some time off to think, don't just listen to your head. Listen to your heart. It's the best career counselor there is. Do what you really love to do, and if you don't know quite what that is yet, well, keep searching. Because if you find it, you'll bring that something extra to your work that will help ensure you will not be automated or outsourced. It will help make you an untouchable radiologist, an untouchable engineer, or an untouchable teacher. End quote. If you never figure out what you want to do, you will probably be frustrated all of your life. Author Stephen Covey observed, quote, How different our lives are when we really know what is deeply important to us, and keeping that picture in mind, we manage ourselves each day to be and to know what matters the most. End quote. Knowing yourself and what you want to do is one of the most important things you'll ever do in this life. Question 3. Can you do what you would like to do? When I was a minister, I once had a young man named Bobby working for me. He was my worship leader, and if you're unfamiliar with that role, it's the person who prepares the music for a Sunday service, leads the other singers and musicians, and actually leads the congregation in singing. I could see that Bobby was an unhappy person, and I suspected that he would rather be doing something different. So one day, I sat him down for a heart-to-heart -heart talk. He confessed that he was really unhappy, and I asked him, Bobby, what would you like to do? He hesitated a moment and then confided, I'd really like to be the announcer for the Chicago Cubs baseball team. All I could think of was, you're going to be unhappy for a very long time. He didn't have the skills to do that job. Even if he did, the job was not available. I told him he needed to find something more realistic that aligned with his gifts and opportunities. There's a big difference between having a dream that propels you to achieve and pulling an idea out of thin air that has no connection with who you are and what you can do. I feel so strongly about helping people with this problem that I wrote a book about it called Put Your Dream to the Test. You must have some kind of criteria for knowing if the desire you have matches the abilities you possess. Warren Bennis has also developed something to help people with this issue. He offers three questions you can ask yourself to identify if what you want to do is possible. Ask yourself, first, do you know the difference between what you want and what you're good at? These two things don't always match up. I believe that was the case for Bobby. What he wanted and what he could do were two very different things. To be successful, you need to be doing what you are good at. Ask yourself, do you know what drives you and what gives you satisfaction? Sometimes people get it in their heads to do something for the wrong reasons. Maybe the job they want doesn't look like hard work when in fact it is. Or they want the rewards that come with the job, not the work itself. When what motivates you lines up with what satisfies you, that is a powerful combination. Ask yourself, do you know what your values and priorities are and what your organization's values and priorities are? The more you can align these two, the greater your chance of success. If you and your employer are working at cross purposes, success will be hard to achieve. Measuring the differences between what you want and what you're able to do, what drives you and what satisfies you, and your values and those of the organization reveals many of the obstacles between you and what you want to do. At that point, the question you need to ask yourself is whether you are able to overcome those differences. One of the main keys to being successful and fulfilling your purpose is to understand your unique talents and to find the right arena in which to use them. Some people have an inherent ability to know who they are and who they're not. Others have to work hard to make those discoveries. Poet and critic Samuel Johnson observed, quote, Almost every man wastes part of his life in attempts to display qualities which he does not possess. End quote. 
your goal should be to waste as little of your life as possible. As former MLB catcher Jim Sundberg says, quote, discover your uniqueness, then discipline yourself to develop it, end quote. Question number four, do you know why you want to do what you would like to do? I believe it's very important not only to know what you want to do, but also why you want to do it. I say that because motives matter. When you do things for the right reason, it gives you inner strength when things go wrong. Right motives help you build positive relationships because they prevent hidden agendas and incline you to put people ahead of your agenda. Doing something for the right reasons also helps life, keeps life less cluttered and your path clearer. Not only is your vision clear, but you will also sleep well at night knowing that you are on the right track. The work that I do is a calling on my life. When I lead or communicate, I think I was born for this. It relies on my strengths. It gives me energy. It makes a difference in the life of others. It fulfills me and gives me a touch of the eternal. I believe you can have the same kind of satisfaction and can experience success if you do the things you were meant to do and do them for the right reasons. Take time to reflect. Explore your intentions and attitudes. As psychiatrist Carl Jung advised, quote, your, advice, your vision will become clear only when you look into your heart. Who looks outside dreams. Who looks inside awakens. End quote. The first four questions you, you should ask yourself relate to what you want to do. As I said at the beginning of the chapter, you must know yourself to grow yourself. That's the law of awareness. But I want to help you to do more than just know what to do. I want you to have a sense of how to start moving in that, in that direction. That will help you to target and eventually fine-tune your growth. With that in mind, the remaining questions will help you to create a game plan. Question 5. Do you know what to do so you can do what you want to do? To move from what you're doing now to what you want to do is a process. Do you know what it will take? I believe it begins with awareness. Darren Hardy, the publisher of Success Magazine, says, quote, Picture where you are in any area right now. Now picture where you want to be, richer, thinner, happier, you name it. The first step toward change is awareness. If you want to get from where you are now to where you want to be, you have to start by becoming aware of the choices that lead you away from your desired destination. Become very conscious of every choice you make today so you can begin to make smarter choices moving forward. End quote. You cannot change direction if you aren't aware that you're not headed where you want to go. That probably sounds obvious, but have you taken the time to look at where your current choices and activities are taking you? Spend some time really thinking about where you're presently headed. If it's not where you want to go, then write out what steps you need to take to go where you desire to go to do what you want to do. Make them as tangible as possible. Will they definitely be the right steps? Maybe, maybe not but you won't know for sure until you start moving forward. And that takes us to the next phase, action. You cannot win if you do not begin. The people who get ahead in the world are the ones who look for the circumstances they want. And if they can't find them, they make them. That means taking initiative. It means doing something specific every day that will take you another step closer to your goal. It means continuing to do it every day. Nearly all successes are the fruit of initiative. Next is accountability. Few things prompt a person to follow through like accountability. One of the ways you can do that is to make your goals public. When you tell others about what you intend to do, it puts pressure on you to keep working at it. You can request the specific individuals ask about your progress. It's similar to having a deadline to keep you moving. You can even write things down as a form of accountability. That's what Darren Hardy suggests. He says that you should track every action that pertains to an area where you want to see improvement, whether it relates to finances, health, career, or relationships. Quote, simply carry around a small notebook, something you'll keep in your pocket or purse at all times, and a writing instrument, says Hardy. You're going to write it all down, every day, without fail, no excuses, no exceptions, as if Big Brother is watching you. Doesn't sound like much fun, I know, writing things down on a little piece, piece of paper. But tracking my progress and missteps is one of the reasons I've accumulated the success I have. This process forces you to be conscious of your decisions. End quote. Next is attraction. If you become aware of the steps you must take to do what you want to do, 
take action, and become accountable for following through, you will begin to produce the behavior you desire and you will start getting closer to doing what you want to do. And that will start to result in a positive side effect. You start attracting like-minded people. The law of magnetism in the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership says, who you are is who you attract. That is true in leadership, but it is also true in every other aspect of life. And as my mother used to say, birds of a feather flock together. If you want to be around growing people, become a growing person. If you're committed, you attract others who are committed. If you are growing, you attract others who are growing. This puts you in a position to begin building a community of like-minded people who can help one another succeed. Question number six. Do you know people who do what you'd like to do? My greatest growth has always come as a result of finding people ahead of me who are able to show the way forward. Some of them have helped me through personal contact, but most have helped through the books they have written. When I had questions, I found answers in their wisdom. When I wanted to learn how to lead better, I looked to Melvin Maxwell, Bill Hybels, John Wooden, Oswald Sanders, Jesus Christ, and hundreds of others to show me the way. If I've learned how to communicate more effectively, it is because I've learned from Andy Stanley, Johnny Carson, Howard Hendricks, Ronald Reagan, Billy Graham, and hundreds of others. If I create and write in a way that helps others, it's because Les Stobie, Max Licato, Charlie Wetzel, Les Perot, Bob Buford, and others have spent time with me. If you have discovered what you want to do, start finding people who do what you want to do with excellence. Then do what you must to learn from them. First, get committed. Pay people for their time if necessary. Be consistent. Meet purposefully every month with someone who can teach you. Be creative. Start with their books if you can't meet them in person. Be purposeful. Spend two hours in preparation for every hour of interaction. Be reflective. Spend two hours in reflection for every hour of interaction. And be grateful. These people are gifts to your personal growth. Be sure to let them know. Always remember that you cannot get where you want to go on your own. You will need the help of others to guide you on your way. Question number seven. Should you do what you'd like to do with them? If you are someone who is dedicated to personal growth, you will always be learning from many people in many places. Occasionally, you will have an opportunity to be mentored on an ongoing basis by an individual. Being mentored by someone who is successful in your area of interest has great value, and I will discuss it more thoroughly in the Law of Modeling chapter. However, I pause now to give you advice as you approach a mentor. If you find a potential mentor, know that the following are your responsibility. To possess a teachable spirit. To always be prepared for the time you get with your mentor. To set the agenda by asking great questions. To demonstrate how you've learned from your time together. And to be accountable for what you have learned. As someone who has mentored a lot of people, I can tell you of what I think the responsibilities of a mentor are. My responsibility to the people I mentor is to add value. My goal is always to help them to become more than they are, not to try to make them something that they're not. These are the 10 areas I focus on. Strengths, temperament, track record, passion, choices, advice, support and resources and people, game plan, feedback, and encouragement. For each of these areas, think about what specific contribution you can offer to the person you are mentoring. One of the people I have enjoyed investing in is Courtney McBath of Norfolk, Virginia. The first time I met with him, he said the following, here's what I asked, here's what you shared, here's what I did, now can I ask more questions? With someone who follows through like that, my answer is always yes. Every person who can help you is not necessarily the right person to help you. You must pick and choose, and so must they. Your goal should be to find a fit that is mutually beneficial for both mentor and mentee. Question number eight. Will you pay the price to do what you want to do? Author and educator James Thom said, quote, Perhaps the most honest self-made man ever was the one we heard say, I got to the top the hard way fighting my own laziness and ignorance every step of the way, end quote. That sure has a lot of truth to it, doesn't it? When it comes to barriers to success, we are usually our own worst enemies. Several years ago, I came across a piece called Dream Big. 
It's full of encouraging words, but also captures what it takes to follow your dreams. It says, quote, If there ever was a time to dare, to make a difference, to embark on something worth doing, it is now. Not for any grand cause, necessarily, but for something that tugs at your heart. Something that's your aspiration. Something that's your dream. You owe it to yourself to make your days here count. Have fun. Dig deep. Stretch. Dream big. Know, though, that things worth doing seldom come easy. There will be good days and there will be bad days. There will be days when you want to turn around, pack it up, and call it quits. Those times tell you that you are pushing yourself, that you are not afraid to learn by trying. End quote. Taking the steps necessary to live your dreams and do what you want to do will cost you. You will have to work hard. You will have to make sacrifices. You will have to keep learning and growing and changing. Are you willing to pay that price? I certainly hope you are. But know this, most people are not. Question number nine. When can you start doing what you'd like to do? Ask people when they will do what they want to do, and most answer that they hope to do it someday. Why not now? Because you're not ready? Perhaps you're not, but if you wait until you are, maybe you will never do it. Most of the accomplishments I've achieved in life I began to attempt before I was really ready. When I was teaching pastors leader, leadership in 1984 they, and they asked for ongoing teaching, I wasn't ready to give it to them. But during a conference with 34 people in Jackson, Mississippi, I decided to pass around a legal pad and get the contact information for anyone who wanted to receive a monthly leadership tape. All 34 signed up. Was I ready to start a monthly leadership subscription series? No, but did I start it anyway? Yes. When I needed to raise money to relocate my church, did I know how to do it? No. Did I start to do it anyways? Yes. When I founded Equip to teach leadership to people in countries around the world, did I have a proven strategy to get it done? No. Did we get started anyway? Yes. Nobody ever got ready by waiting. You only get ready by starting. Question number 10. What will it be like when you get to do what you'd like to do? Because I've had the privilege of doing what I've always wanted to do, I want to help you see ahead to what it's like. First, it will be different from what you imagined. I never thought that I would affect as many people as I do. I never knew life would be so beautiful. I never thought that I would want to occasionally withdraw from people to think and write. But I also never anticipated the expectations others would put on me to produce. When you do what you want to do, it will be more difficult than you ever imagined. I had no idea how much time it would take to be effective. I never expected to have such great demands put on my life or to have to keep paying the price to be successful. I also never dreamed that my energy level would go down as much as it has in recent years. Finally, let me tell you this. When you do what you've always wanted to do, it will be better than you ever imagined. When I started investing in my personal growth, I didn't anticipate a compounding return. For me personally, for the individuals I've mentored, and for my team. And I never dreamed that it would be this fun. Nothing else compares to doing what you were created to do. A few years ago at Exchange, a leadership event I host for executives each year, we were privileged to have Coretta Scott King and Bernice King as two of our speakers. As we all sat in the sanctuary at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta and listened to them tell stories, what the exchange attendees most wanted to know about was Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Bernice told us that there were many speakers scheduled to address the crowd that day on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Many of them jockeyed for the best places in the speaking order, hoping to get TV time. Bernice's father gave up his time. He didn't care about his place on the docket. All he cared about was getting to communicate with the people. And when he did, it made history. Why? Because he was doing what he was made to do. The next year, the Civil Rights Act was passed in Washington, D.C. King had followed his passion, found his purpose, and as a result, made an impact on the world. People say that there are two great days in a person's life, the day you were born and the day you discover why. I want to encourage you to seek what you were put on this earth to do, and then pursue it with all your effort. Applying the Law of Awareness to Your Life 
The questions in this chapter are designed to prompt you to know yourself and to get on course to do what you were made to do in life. Here is a streamlined version of the questions. Spend a significant amount of time answering them so you have a plan of action to follow when you're done. 1. What would you like to do? 2. What talents, skills, and opportunities do you possess that support your desire to do it? 3. What are your motives for wanting to do it? 4. What steps must you take, beginning today, to start doing what you want to do? Remember, awareness, action, and accountability. 5. Whose advice can you get to help you along the way? 6. What price are you willing to pay? What will it cost you in time, resources, and sacrifices? And finally, 7. Where do you need to grow the most? You must focus on your strengths and overcome any weaknesses that would keep you from reaching your goal. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.